Okay, good morning. Um, it is my pleasure this morning to introduce our Grand Round speaker, Dr. Jason Berman, who has traveled here from Dalhousie University in Halifax. Um, and for those of us who don't travel that much, um, one might just to kind of refresh in terms of where he came from. <laughs> yes, actually there was a very interesting story behind this particular one about some uh, clash of two ships that happened um, and an explosion that happened uh, early in history. But anyway, yes. And I was a bit concerned actually when I, after I invited uh, Dr. Berman to come, thinking about what this might cost the department in airfare. But I am very happy to say that his airfare was just a little bit under what um, I paid the day before yesterday to take a 38-minute flight to Madison, Wisconsin to do a cab <laughs> inspection on Delta. So um, Dr. Berman did his training. Um, his, he got his MD from the University of Toronto and then went on to do a residency in the Department of Pediatrics at the Hospital for Sick Children at the University of Toronto in Toronto. After that, he went to, um, on to do his research and clinical fellowship in Peds Hemonc at Harvard at Dana-Farber. And as he just told our uh, current fellow, who also came out of a postdoc um, at Harvard, that he didn't graduate there, he survived there, and then <laughs> took his um, position um, at the University at Dalhousie in Halifax. And I actually know uh, Dr. Berman as a colleague from Children's Oncology Group, where we both sit on a acute myeloid leukemia um, disease group. But uh, Dr. Berman is on the forefront, he is now a co-PI of a new protocol for Down syndrome patients who have acute myeloid leukemia. And he's very involved both in the clinical realm, because he is a practicing clinical peds hemonc person, as well as having this other life as a very preeminent um, scientist within, uh, who uses zebrafish as a model. Many of us know zebrafish really from the developmental kind of functional genomics of discovery of genes and their function and whether or not they're clinically significant or not um, in terms of germline types of things. But what Dr. Berman has really done has been one of a small group, really, relatively, who have really promoted this model and shown its tremendous value for understanding some of the basics as well as translational issues related to um, hematologic malignancies and solid tumors. He's also shown that it has been a very valuable tool for preclinical identification of um, drugs for, uh, and targetable uh, drug therapy. And so, and he has built one of the preeminent zebrafish facilities, or they have built for him um, at Dalhousie, uh, one of the preeminent kind of zebrafish research uh, enterprises. So I'm really delighted that he will be here today to talk about this model and how people are truly using it um, for both basic and translational research. Thank you, Jason. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Betsy, for that kind uh, introduction and for the kind invitation to speak at Grand Rounds. I think only a Canadian would come to Minnesota in the winter, so uh, I'm here. It was a bit uh, challenging with the flights yesterday, but I'm delighted uh, to be here in this beautiful city and uh, uh, to give you uh, really somewhat of an overview of some of the things that we've been working on over the past, really, uh, almost 11 years now uh, in terms of using the fish as a uh, preclinical uh, cancer model. Um, and um, uh, really, I hope that you'll uh, have an appreciation of um, the power of the fish to, to answer questions in cancer biology. These are the objectives that, uh, that I provided um, that um, I hope to be able to go through today, demonstrating the utility of the fish as a cancer model, showing you both some genetic and xenograft approaches, uh, highlighting um, some new opportunities, things that we've been working on studying the tumor microenvironment, a very hot topic um, in oncology. Um, and then um, really what's uh, started as a side project but really has blossomed into this idea of looking at um, 
toxicity and, uh, and how the fish model can um, uh, inform uh, uh, protective drugs so we can give safer uh, therapies. And my goal really at the end is to try to convince you that we can use a, uh, uh, a simple vertebrate model uh, to teach us about um, human disease. So why would we want to even uh, do work uh, in the zebrafish? Um, the zebrafish really has a lot of advantages. Um, first of all, they undergo rapid development, which I'm going to show. I'm going to play this little movie here. I have a number of movies to show you. This is a zebrafish uh, zygote where the cell has split in two. This is the yolk sac that provides nutrition. And as I'm talking here, I'm just going to play this movie that goes through the first 22 hours of zebrafish development. And I think you appreciate the uh, rapid speed of development, the optical clarity of the zebrafish embryos um, uh, as it goes through gastrulation and uh, segmentation and, and the body becomes patterned. So really there's rapid development and really high levels of genetic conservation with humans at the protein level about 75%. So here you have a zebrafish embryo now at about 22 hours of development. Here's the head and the tail and the yolk sac. We can also ha uh, do a lot of genetic manipulation in the zebrafish. Um, initially this was really just with mRNA and morpholinos which are transient knockdowns. But more recently, we have the, uh, the uh, advent of talons and CRISPR-based technology, of which we've developed a fair bit of expertise in our laboratory. I'm not going to talk a lot about that uh, today, uh, only to say, as I mentioned last night, we're involved with a, uh, a large project, program project funded uh, last year by the Terry Fox Cancer Research Institute to model leaf Romani syndrome. Um, and we're using the zebrafish to do that um, and employing CRISPR technology. I'm happy to talk about that more at the end. Um, to remind people the, uh, um, the opportunity to make these genetic uh, manipulations is facilitated by the fact that we just inject these things into the yolk sac of a zebrafish. So here's a zebrafish embryo, here's the embryo at the one cell stage, and we can inject mRNA, morpholinos, CRISPRs, talons. We also have a lot of high throughput readouts, and I'll show you how, do you how we employ some of these. So once we've made these various models, we can then interrogate them um, genetically. Um, initially, we've done this with microarray. Now we can do them with RNA-seq. We were one of the first labs to do this with methyl-seq. Um, there are a number of readouts that we can use, looking at apoptosis, uh, cell cycle. Um, and uh, our lab has really been pioneers in performing xenotransplantation, where we put human cancer cells into the fish and use this as a preclinical readout. And I'll talk about that today. In all of these various cases of models, we can then take these embryos and do preclinical drug screening. Because they're so small, we can array these into 96 well plates, a couple of embryos to a well, treat them with various different drugs, and using um, robotics can really automate this so we can do fairly high throughput um, screening. So again, we can do this in the fish because there's a high level of uh, conservation at the phylogenetics level, just to remind people where uh, zebrafish fall compared to humans. At the gene level, at the chromosome level, last night I was asked how many chromosomes the zebrafish has. They have 25 chromosomes, so you can see the correlation here, uh, the syntony with the, the human chromosomes. But importantly, also at the organ level. And I want to stress this because this is relevant for some of the toxicity studies we've been doing compared to some other models like Drosophila uh, or C. elegans. We have the benefit when we do these in a whole uh, organism context that we have conservation of organ systems. Drugs are metabolized in similar ways in zebrafish. And this really can inform some of the things that um, we're trying to understand for humans. Oops. So I'm first going to talk a little bit about acute myeloid leukemia. As Betsy mentioned, this is a disease that's very close to my heart um, and, and really my um, clinical focus um, through the children's oncology group. Um, and I probably don't need to remind this audience that, you know, despite all of our efforts over a number of years, really our outcomes in AML, both in pediatrics and adults, have been um, um, modest. Um, compared, uh, certainly in the pediatric word, world, compared to ALL, where we've made uh, tremendous improvements um, in, uh, in the outcome of those patients. Um, and um, uh, to remind people in pediatrics that this is really tends to be a disease of, uh, of teenagers. So there are a number, as, as uh, everyone in this audience is aware, there's uh, lots of molecular subtypes of AML. It's a better, very heterogeneous disease. And we've been focusing on um, AML, where there's upregulation of uh, HOXA9, 
um, which is a homeobox gene, one of the posterior homobox genes that's involved with developmental patterning, as can be seen by this image uh, on the right. Um, HOXA9 uh, is here. There are in humans uh, four HOX clusters and 13 paralog groups. And you can see this is very well conserved from Drosophila uh, to humans. In blood development, HOXA9 is very important um, for hematopoiesis expressed in hematopoietic stem cells um, and then decreased expression in more mature uh, precursors and um, differentiated cells. Importantly, HOXA9 is overexpressed in 80% of AML um, and really is associated with a poor outcome. HOXA9 may be overexpressed in a number of different ways, including uh, by fusions such as the NUP98 HOXA9 fusion, which is really the most famous fusion, which associates with a number of other factors, such as the PBX factors. And as you see from this diagram, really sits at a crossroads downstream of a lot of uh, upstream regulators like the PML RARA, uh, MLL genes, um, uh, to initiate downstream transcription. HOXA9 functions as a transcription factor and can both activate um, and uh, turn off gene expression. And so we were interested in modeling this NUP98 HOXA9 translocation, the 711 translocation shown here uh, in the uh, zebrafish uh, model. And so what we did is we created a transgenic, this is using transgenic approaches, we used the SPI1 or the PU.1 um, myeloid specific promoter and created an inducible construct expressing the uh, human NUP98 HOXA9 that was a gift from Gary Gilliland. Um, and we created this conditional system where we have LOX P sites, EGFP, and a stop codon. So when you inject this in fish, you can see you get expression in myeloid cells. So before I showed you that zebrafish embryo, uh, you'll become familiar with those pictures. So again, here's the head and the tail. And these arrows are pointing to these um, um, foci, which are uh, myeloid cells expressing GFP. Um, and they are in sites of embryonic hematopoiesis here at the anterior lateral mesoderm and the posterior blood island. You can see that continues uh, into adulthood. And the way that this um, inducible construct works is that um, you need to cross that to, uh, the heat, to a promoter uh, driving Cree. Cree recombinates here. This is driven by the heat shock promoter. So these fish are crossed to these heat shock um, promoter Cree fish and then their embryos are exposed uh, to 37 degrees. Uh, Cree acts as a molecular scissors, uh, cuts out this construct, and then you have NUP98 downstream of uh, the PU.1 or SPI1 promoter. And when you do that and grow these fish up in germline, you actually get a myeloproliferative neoplasm. So in the zebrafish, the kidney is the hematopoietic uh, organ there uh, that's analogous to the bone marrow. You can see here in wild-type fish, uh, for the pathologists in the room, uh, this should look familiar in terms of uh, the kidney structures you would see in mammals with tubules labeled with T, glomeruli. Uh, but what's different is you have these hematopoietic islands here. Um, in, uh, in the kidney. And in these diseased fish, you can see here, they have protuberant abdomens, they have all this dark coloration uh, in their kidney and liver, and when you look at their kidneys here, you can see that there's um, a complete absence of uh, glomerular and tubular elements. Um, the kidneys have re are really full with um, my different types of myeloid cells that are indicated here. And really, um, we were able to generate a myeloproliferative disease. We really didn't see blast populations, but a myeloproliferative disease. So that, and that was about 25% of, uh, of fish. So that, that's a pretty high frequency. Importantly, a lot of the work that we do in the zebrafish is at the embryonic level. And so these fish also had an embryonic phenotype where they had decreased expression of GATA1 marking red blood cells and increased expression of LCP1 or L-plastin marking white blood cells. Again, here you can see the embryos in a side profile, the head, the tail, um, and the arrows marking the difference between the wild type and the activated um, uh, transgenic embryos. So having this provided us a, um, a phenotype that we could actually use for uh, interrogating this disease. Um, we looked at the stem cell level as well because uh, there's a thought that um, since NUP98 HOXA9 and HOXA9 is a stem cell gene, um, what happens at the stem cell level? And interestingly, we saw here marking with RUNCS1 and CMIB, which marks hematopoietic stem cells, which arise in the dorsal aorta of the zebrafish around 36 hours. Here in the wild type, you can see a normal number of stem cells and an increased number of stem cells in the transgenic. That's quantified here. And then by flow cytometry, we have a number of transgenic lines that express fluorescent markers. This is um, CD41 driving EGFP, so again, driving this specifically in stem cells. And you can see this is the normal number of stem cells in the dorsal aorta, and here is an increased number of uh, stem cells. And then because they're fluorescent, we can quantify that with FAS. 
So we wanted to look at um, uh, the downstream pathways. Interestingly, the phenotype we had was similar to a phenotype that Randy Peterson and Joanna Ye had published a few years before us um, in a transgenic zebrafish model expressing the AML1 ETO um, uh, um, translocation, a very well-known translocation that's associated with good prognosis in AML. Um, and those, pay, uh, those um, fish actually uh, had uh, uh, increased activity of the prostaglandin pathway, and they were able to restore normal hematopoiesis by uh, blocking the prostaglandin pathway. So we wanted to see if we could do the same thing in our fish, uh, treating them either with uh, indomethacin or with NS398, which is a specific uh, PG2 inhibitor. And I think you can appreciate here in the wild type, uh, this is looking at the number of white blood cells. So here again, the myeloproliferative phenotype of increased white blood cells and we're able to restore normal uh, increased red blood cells here compared to the wild type and the transgenic, and we're able to restore uh, normal uh, blood cell numbers um, uh, with uh, treatment. And again, this is just adding the drugs to the water, and the numbers here in the corner show you the number with that phenotype, and again, that's quantified here. Now, then we wanted to look if we could identify other downstream pathways that weren't known in NUP98 HOXA9 disease because this disease has a poor outcome, needs better treatments, and targeting Hox genes as transcription factors is A, difficult to do, and B, one may not want to do that. Given their role in development, it may dysregulate lots of different things. And so what we did at this time was a microarray. Now we would do RNA-seq, but we did a microarray. We uh, affectionately call this fish and chips. And so... Um, you can see here you get one of these heat maps where you have um, uh, genes that are increased and decreased in um, uh, the transgenic embryos compared to wild type. Um, and one of the most overexpressed genes was this gene called DNMT1, DNA methyltransferase 1. And then we're able to uh, confirm that by qPCR. Uh, so what is DNA methyltransferase 1? Uh, uh, everyone in this room is probably very familiar with the concept of epigenetics, and DNMT1 plays an important role in um, uh, maintaining uh, methylation of uh, DNA, adding methyl groups um, uh, to DNA, and uh, resulting in a close con uh, uh, conformation um, and decreased uh, transcription. And importantly, we saw this uh, increase in DNT1. Is this really associated with uh, hypermethylation? And so in collaboration with um, uh, Matt Minge and Martin Hurst at the University of British Columbia um, uh, Cancer Center, and bringing you back to Betsy's map, that's way on the other side of, of the country. Um, geography is not a barrier to collaboration. Um, you can see here in the untreated embryos, this is, the, this is using MEDIP. Um, you can see the level of methylation, and you can see that there's a much higher level of methylation uh, in the transgenics. And this is really the first time that people have done whole genome methylation um, in the uh, zebrafish. I should mention, this is specifically at the promoters. We've looked at, we looked at a number of regions, but I'm going to show you the promoters. Now, DNMT1 can actually be specifically targeted by decitabine, which is an FDA-approved drug used to treat um, MDS. And so what we did was we added decitabine to the water um, of these uh, embryos. Again, here's the wild type. This is the normal level. This is showing you white blood cells. Normal level of white blood cells increased in the transgenic. And when we add decitabine, um, we are able to restore uh, normal levels of um, hematopoiesis. And we always treat the wild type as well because we want to look, uh, look for toxicity, which we did not see. How long does the exposure, this, so we did a couple of different, this was a six-hour exposure. Yeah. This was a six-hour exposure. Importantly, as I showed you, we see in ab abnormalities in these fish, uh, the transgenic fish at the stem cell level as well, and so again, using RUNX1 and CMIB, uh, in the transgenic, again, we get increased um, numbers of, of these hematopoietic stem cells, presumably functioning as leukemic stem cells, um, and we're able to, at the stem cell level, restore uh, normal um, uh, stem cell numbers um, as well. And then importantly, again, going back to Vancouver with our samples, looking to show that actually we don't just see that by in situ in terms of RNA expression, but actually um, if you look at the treated with the cytobine in the yellow line, we've now reduced methylation uh, back to um, uh, wild type levels. Now it's interesting, depending on uh, to your question about exposure and dose, we've looked in some cases, in some cases we actually restored methylation below wild type levels. So we hypomethylated the genome, and one can ask, you know, is this a good thing to hypomethylate one's genome? You know, who knows? Again, patients are being given these drugs. Of course, it doesn't just affect their MDS cells or their AML cells. But this was very exciting because this suggested that decitabine may, might be a biologically 
relevant treatment for patients with NUP98, HOX-A9-induced uh, um, AML. And in data I don't have time to show you today, we actually looked at combination therapy with HDAC inhibitors and showed we could actually give lower dose of decitabine together with the HDAC inhibitor and restore, similarly, um, restore hematopoiesis and methylation. Importantly, well, so we showed this in the fish, is this relevant? And together with Kim Stegmauer at Dana-Farber, um, we were able to interrogate a number of uh, human AML databases, uh, the Wooters database and the TCGA, and show actually that in human disease, both prostaglandin um, uh, PTGS2, which was uh, upregulated, as well as DNMT1, um, were similarly um, uh, upregulated in high-risk AML, and we saw this correlation um, with, uh, with high-risk disease. In one of them, we actually saw a correlation with lower-risk disease, but in most of them, things like TP53 mutations, high-risk disease, um, complex karyotype, um, there was a positive correlation in at least um, one of these databases. So again, that really suggests the relevance of doing this modeling in the fish, that this can translate back to human disease. So now, what have we done? We published this work last year. Now we are, uh, I'm a pediatric oncologist. NUP98, HOXA9 is not particularly common in pediatrics. But this abnormality, NUP98, NSD1 is, and this is a reasonably uh, recently described abnormality in pediatric AML, um, really thanks to uh, work of Bob Arsisi and Sohel Mashinshi um, and the, the Target Initiative, which is specifically looking at pediatric um, AML. As many of you probably know, many of the mutations and abnormalities that are frequent in adult AML are not present in pediatric AML. If we don't study pediatric AML samples, we're not going to learn about these. And so NUP98 NSD1 has been associated with a particularly poor prognosis as shown by this publication from Sohel's group a couple of years ago. This is with regards to... Um, 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 uh, relapse rate, um, and this is with regards to, um, sorry, this is with regards to uh, uh, clinical remission rate. You can see that if you have um, NSD1, which is frequently associated with uh, the FLT3 internal tandem duplication, that that actually gives you the worse prognosis than even ITD alone. And here again, if you look at FLT3 ITD together with NUP98 NSD1 in pediatrics, that combination um, gives you the worst outcome um, than um, having um, FLT3 ITD alone. And we know FLT3 ITD is a poor prognostic factor. About 80% of patients that have uh, NUP98 NSD1 will also have a FLT3 uh, ITD. So again, this is NUP98, which I introduced uh, before. It's a nucleoporin gene, and here it's binding with um, NSD1, um, which is a histone methyltransferase uh, uh, indicated here. And so you get abnormal um, histone uh, methylation, um, and it occurs together with FLT3ITD, which um, many here I'm sure are familiar with, where you get this internal tandem duplication um, shown here. So we've wanted to model this in fish. We've used a ubiquitous promoter in this case using the human gene. You can see here these cells that are flowing through here, uh, throwing through the, the vasculature of the fish. These are um, um, myeloid cells flowing through, which is kind of neat, the fluorescently labeled with GFP. And you can see expression here in myeloid cells, both at 24 hours and 36 hours, um, suggesting that we, uh, this is in transients, but that even with a ubiquitous promoter, we're getting expression in the cells in which we're interested. And then um, Corey uh, Filiagi, who's a grad student in the lab, um, did whole mountain situ hybridizations, as I've shown you for the NUP98 HOXA9 fish. And we're seeing a similar phenotype that we saw in them. Again, looking at GATA1 for red blood cells, um, levels are reduced. Um, monocytes, uh, levels are increased. Um, uh, neutrophils uh, at two time points, uh, levels are increased. Interestingly, we don't seem to see effect at the stem cell level. So perhaps, uh, again, the fish is allowing us to understand maybe this translocation, even though it's still a NUP98 translocation, um, is acting at a slightly different time point um, in um, hematopoietic uh, development, maybe has a different cell of origin. Um, and so th this is early days with this project. Again, the goal here is to um, uh, um, do RNA-seq to look at downstream uh, targets and to do some drug screening and we're in the process of putting in a grant application to do that. Okay, so I'm going to switch uh, gears a little bit. Um, that we really focused on transgenic approaches and really for the remainder of my talk 
um, I'm now going to talk about um, our xenograft approaches. And this is something that we really um, have been one of the pioneers in doing. I'm very proud of this work and really started this work, I think, in around 2009. And here the idea was, could we use the fish as an in vivo incubator, as a, as a live organism to do the things that people are doing in mice in terms of looking at human cells and doing preclinical uh, drug uh, discovery? Um, because mice are expensive and costly um, and, um, and slow and really difficult to work with. And certainly for trying to do primary human transplantation, there's lots of challenges. And, uh, and we've been able to do that in fish. So it's a fairly simple algorithm that we use. We take our cells of interest, we fluorescently label them, we inject very small numbers, which is great, 50 to 100 cells into a 48-hour embryo. The embryos are immuno, um, uh, don't need to be immunosuppressed because they only have an innate immune system at this stage in development, so you don't have to worry about irradiation or steroids for, uh, to prevent rejection. You can just inject those human cells in. We screen embryos that have a fluorescent mass at the site of injection, shown in this cartoon. And here is a, uh, a live image. And those that have a fluorescent mass, we keep. Those that don't, we throw out. Um, and then um, we're able to observe these cells, shown here in this movie. And this time, these cells that are whipping through the vasculature are actually human cells. So these are human leukemia cells floating around the vasculature. This is the tail of the fish. Here's the edge of the yolk sac. And the fish that we use for these cells, uh, uh, for these experiments, are these fish called caspers, which are a double pigment mutant developed by Rich White, um, who's in New York now when he was in Lenzon's lab in Boston. And they're a double pigment mutant of the Roy and the, um, and the Nacri fish. And they're called uh, caspers because they're completely transparent. They're a fish that has effectively zebrafish without its stripes. Um, this here you can see, the, this is the ovaries. You can see right through this fish through adulthood. And that really prevents some of the autofluorescent with wild type fish really enhancing our visual um, ability. So important to do this work, it's nice to be able to visualize these cells, but if you really want to use this for um, drug responses, you, you, you need to quantify it in some way. And so we developed a couple of ways of doing this. Our, in our original paper that Dale Corkery, who is a grad student uh, co-supervised by myself and, uh, and Graham Dallaire, who we've done all these uh, xenograft work with, um, what we did was once we did these injections um, and then we treated the fish with drug or not with drug, we look for proliferation. In order to do that, we can both look and see the cell numbers, but then we dissociate the fish uh, into single cell suspension um, and then basically put them on a slide. And we have an algorithm where we can count the cells using image J and really creates um, a pretty robust quantification to look at how much proliferation is happening and what time and whether um, a given drug uh, exposure uh, does that. And in this original paper, we did a proof of principle uh, study using a matinib and K562 cells targeted, targeting BCR able and ATRA and uh, NB4 cells targeting PML RARA and showing by adding those to the water that we got a specific response um, when we had matched drug and target. Then more recently, when we started using primary patient samples, and I'll show you this data in a moment, this didn't work very well because the human cells divided so quickly. And so in order to do that, um, Victoria Bentley, who is a former graduate student in the lab, now a medical student, developed a, um, a, an approach to use IHC to specifically label a protein that was only expressed in human cells and not in zebrafish. So while it's great that there's all this conservation, there's also advantages to a lack of conservation. Um, and PML, that's expressed, promyelocytic leukemia, um, protein is expressed in most cells. And so um, we were able to specifically label uh, the human cells and then use that for quantification. And we've now um, used this xenograft approach for many, many different types of cells. We've done uh, many human cancers, leukemias, breast cancers, sarcomas, um, uh, um, neuroblastomas, um, and more, most recently, um, uh, uh, prostate cancer. Uh, I want to show you this image um, because we've been testing this light sheet scope, uh, which is a Zeiss um, uh, microscope, where uh, the light comes in perpendicularly to the objective and gives you this uh, wonderful uh, depth of focus. Um, and uh, we will be acquiring the scope um, through an infrastructure grant in the next couple of months, which is very exciting. So here, I'm going to show you a little movie. Here's the fish. Here's the, the eye, the head. Um, here is the tail. This is the yolk sac. These are these so-called flasper embryos. We've taken those casper, those transparent embryos, crossed them with a line that expresses 
um, GFP in the vasculature driven by the fly one promoter. So you get these transparent fish that have green fluorescent vasculature. And here we've injected the SKNAS neuroblastoma cell line. And I think you can appreciate the, uh, in this 3D image how clearly you can see these cells, the vasculature, and you can imagine um, over time how you could study these cells, their migration through the vasculature using anti-angiogenic drugs, etc. So uh, really um, powerful imaging um, and really highlights the optical clarity of the embryo. So I want to give another example of how we've used the xenograft approach. Uh, and this way is really to sort of personalize cancer therapy. Um, and this is the example of T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, um, another uh, high-risk um, uh, malignancy that affects both uh, children and, and adults. Um, compared to AML, TALL is a little bit more common, though it's really only 10 to 15 percent of ALL. Most of ALL in pediatrics is B-cell ALL. Um, and uh, as people are aware, uh, with uh, TALL, you have T... Um, uh, lymphoblasts that uh, bear uh, T lineage markers, and um, these patients tend to have a poor outcome than BALL patients and require uh, more intensive uh, therapies. Um, and really, uh, even with contemporary protocols of intensive therapies, the outcome for these patients is still uh, not where we'd like it to be. And so uh, additional uh, novel therapies, more targeted therapies would be beneficial. Well, while the outcome is not as good in TALL, we know a lot about the TALL pathway, uh, the pathways that are involved in TALL um, that really um, all um, uh, interface down the PI3 kinase pathway. And through efforts of a number of folks and a number of labs, including my colleague Adolfo Ferrando when he was in uh, Tom Look's lab where I did my postdoc, um, there's uh, large numbers of uh, TALL uh, cases that have mutations uh, in NOTCH. Um, an even larger number that have loss of function mutations in the P10 tumor suppressor and others that have activating mutations in, um, uh, in the PI3 kinase pathway. And all of these um, uh, lead to activation of AKT and mTOR and, um, and, and growth signals. So these pathways provide a lot of opportunities for uh, drug inhibition with um, gamma secretase inhibitors such as compound E, which is really not really a clinically used compound, um, but uh, is a, a sort of a parent compound gamma secretase inhibitor. AKT inhibitors, one of the classic ones is tricerabine, and of course um, uh, mTOR uh, inhibitors. And so what we want to see is could we use this uh, zebrafish xenotransplantation platform to personalize therapy for um, children with TALO? So first we wanted to see if we, um, using cell lines, whether we would see the same selective uh, drug response. So here we have a number of different cell lines, Jurcats, Carpass, and TALL. And you can see here that they have different responses to particular drugs. So um, Jurcats are specifically sensitive to rapamycin, and the Carpass specifically to tricerabine, and the TALL specifically to um, uh, compound E. So that, this is in vitro. So we said, OK, let's see if we see the same effect in vivo. And of course, we did. So here we injected these various cell lines into the fish. You can appreciate here in these images, um, this is at baseline. And then this is 48 hours. HPT is hours post-treatment. You can see the cell numbers um, increasing uh, over time in the untreated, um, but uh, decreasing in the treated. And then that's all quantified here. And again, we see these specific selective responses for the Jurcat to rapamycin for the carpass to tricerabine, and for the TALLs to, um, uh, to compound E. Um, and you can see the, these um, stars indicate the uh, statistical significance. Again, these were cells. Subsequently, we pulled them out. We d did our image J calculations to quantify specific, um, specific responses. So that was great. We next wanted to see, could we now use this for patients? And so we really were one of the first labs that um, took primary patient samples and engrafted them to zebrafish. So with consent from uh, families at the time of uh, diagnostic bone marrow, um, we um, took an additional uh, tube. We could then either use it um, fresh or we could freeze it down. Uh, basically, it's spun down, and then the buffy coat is what we use to inject. Again, we fluorescently label those cells like we did with the cell lines, inject those into the yolk sac of the zebrafish embryo at 48 hours, uh, screen as we did before for fluorescence, and then uh, separate those groups and treat them again with the drugs uh, just in the water and look at um, 
uh, uh, look at what happens in terms of uh, cell numbers. And so what we did is we looked at two, uh, two of my patients uh, that had TALL, patient 1 and patient 2, and you can see here uh, when we inject the cells uh, from patient 1 or patient 2 over uh, 72 hours in this case, you see proliferation. This is in the fluorescent images um, of patient sample 1 and patient 2. And in patient 1, when we treat with rapamycin, we don't see any difference. But when we treat with compound E, we actually see that there's, you, you, you have decreased numbers of those cells. And this shows you the, the timing of, of when we did that. And this shows you the quantification. Whereas in patient 2, you get rapid uh, proliferation of those cells. And it doesn't matter whether you treat with rapamycin or compound E. So that was very interesting that we saw this response specifically with, uh, with compound E. And then what we then did is we went back, remember compound E is a gamma secretase inhibitor, that suggests that this patient maybe had a notch mutation, and what we did is we sequenced uh, the notch gene in this patient and found actually that they had a rare um, notch mutation that had only been described uh, uh, once previously that we found in the cosmic uh, database. Uh, patient sample 2 had wild type notch, and then we looked at a number of the other genes in these pathways, and they were all wild type. And so, uh, and then what we did was we validated that with a luciferase assay to show that it actually was causative, and that this mutation shown here had similar luciferase uh, for a change in uh, luciferase as did a well-described uh, mutation in the notch uh, pest domain. And so this was really exciting because it suggested that we could use response in the fish to then go back and look at what the genomic lesion is. And we think that's important because we know that matching genomic lesion with um, treatment doesn't always work. Here you see response and then can go back. Um, and why, why this could, may provide us a, a tool for personalized medicine is we can do this whole assay in a week. So, which would be, of course, unfathomable in a mouse model, um, and that's a short enough time frame that we could then go back to the patient and inform their treatment and say, maybe this patient should um, receive, maybe patient one should get a notch inhibitor, but maybe patient two shouldn't. So that was very exciting, and we, we published that last year. But, you know, we're trying to learn lessons. The fish field is a bit behind the mouse field, and we're trying to learn from the mouse field. And as many people know in terms of the... Um, uh, xenograft approaches in mice, what you get depends a little bit on what kind of mouse you use, um, how immunosuppressed it is, is it expressing certain cytokines, and people have made efforts to so-called humanize mice in order to um, make uh, engraft, engraft fewer cells. Uh, we all know there are studies, uh, numbers of uh, leukemic stem cells and hematopoietic stem cell engraftment has differed uh, depending on these factors. And so we wanted to look at that uh, in the FISH model. We know, as indicated from uh, these cartoons here, that uh, nod skit mice that express stem cell factor in GMCSF may have different engraftment rates. And we also know that the uh, uh, SDF1 CXCR4 pathway is a very important pathway in terms of uh, cell uh, uh, mo uh, mobilization and, uh, and cell homing. And again, we wanted to see um, whether we could create more humanized zebrafish that would really enhance our xenograft platform. And Vinod Kumar Rajan, who is a um, uh, PhD student in my lab, and this was actually done in collaboration with Troy Lund, who's based here, um, who uh, really identified and cloned uh, the zebrafish SDF1 um, alpha uh, promoter. And um, Troy is not here today because he's at the transplant meeting in Hawaii. So I will remind him that I came to Minnesota and he went to Hawaii. Um, but um, uh, he's been incredibly generous uh, with the reagents and both with his advice. And what Vino has done is he's made two transgenic fish, one um, using the zebrafish SDF1 uh, promoter from Troy to drive human SDF uh, in the fish um, so that we can see the response of human cells to human uh, SDF1. And we know there isn't cross-reactivity with fish SDF. Um, and, uh, and then he created a second line. This is a um, bisostronic construct uh, that drives both stem cell factor, again, human stem cell factor, and GMCSF, and this is inducible. It's a tet-inducible system, so you add tetracycline to the water, it turns it on. Uh, you take tetracycline or doxycycline out of the water, it uh, turns it off. So this is what these fish uh, look like. And then we want to look at how this 
these uh, cytokines um, affect migration um, and homing. And this is just a cartoon taken from one of Julian Bertrand's papers when he was in David Traver's lab, just to remind you of where stem cells go normally in the fish. As I mentioned earlier, they're produced in the, uh, in the dorsal aorta, really around 36 hours post-fertilization. Then they sort of migrate out, um, and they go to a couple of places. They go to this uh, caudal hematopoietic tissue at about 40 hours. That's sort of thought to be analogous to the human fetal liver, and they go to the thymus around 50 hours, and then they move into the kidney, which, as I already mentioned, is the site of um, adult hematopoiesis somewhere around 40, 45, uh, 45 um, hours post-fertilization. And this is showing you the head of the fish, because actually the kidney extends along the body of the fish, but a predominant amount of the kidney is, is, is the head kidney. And this shows you expression of some of the stem cell genes that I've already, uh, uh, I've already mentioned. And so what was interesting is when we took um, TLL cell line jerkat cells and injected them into regular caspers or into these caspers expressing SDF1, I think you can appreciate that over three days we saw much more increased migration in those that were expressing uh, SDF1 than uh, in, the, in the wild type, and that's quantified here. Uh, Vino has affectionately named these fish Triton. Um, and, um, and then this, uh, I really love this image because this then shows you fluorescently, here are the, um, uh, the um, uh, TALL uh, jerkat cells. Um, here in, again, the SDF expressing fish, you can see not only do they migrate, but they migrate to the caudal hematopoietic tissue, to the equivalent of the fetal liver, where this is expressed, but they sort of just stick around in the yolk sac uh, in the wild type caspers, and that's highlighted here. So this suggests that we really have created sort of the first humanized fish models mm -hmm. that can really help us now look at not just proliferation, as I showed you before, but homing and, 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 uh, and cell migration. Um, and then this is just a neat picture, again, taken from the light sheet uh, where we're looking at homing. This is with Ellen Cap prostate cancer cells, again, uh, that have been put into these um, cytokine uh, fish. And then we can look at the importance of that access using CRISPR in these cell lines to knock out the CXCR4 receptor in particular cells that express high levels of CXCR4. And again, looking at how important uh, migration is. And this just shows you um, the, uh, the work that Vino has done to uh, start developing these um, CXCR4 knockout lines. We haven't put them into the fish yet. So Betsy alluded to. Um, the fact that her and I sit on this children's oncology group um, myeloid committee. And I mention this today because uh, to answer one of the questions related to um, acute myeloid leukemia and Down syndrome, we're also employing uh, this FISH model. And this is a COG study that just opened in November. I'm co-chairing it with Hans Hitzler um, at SickKids. And I'm not going to belabor this, but this is the study design it's really looking at in the unique uh, myeloid leukemia that occurs in children with Down syndrome can we, for the first time, risk stratify these patients based on minimal residual disease levels by multi-parameter flow cytometry at the end of the first induction cycle and give the majority of patients who respond very well, um, this is a unique leukemia, these patients respond very well to typical therapy with uh, cytarabine and anthracyclines, give them less treatment, but for the small 15 to 20 percent that don't respond, they probably need more intensive therapy. Right now, we're treating all Down syndrome patients the same, and this is really not in keeping with contemporary views that we need to risk stratify patients. And so that's what, uh, that's what we're doing uh, on this study, and to date, there have been two patients enrolled. So that's exciting. Um, but what is the biology of Down syndrome and can, uh, leukemia, and can the fish help us with this? And as I think many know in this audience, you have a hematopoietic cell with trisomy 21, because it's constitutional. All the patients have, uh, all these children have trisomy 21. But in Down syndrome AML, often these patients develop this interesting transient leukemia, TL, or transient myeloproliferative disease as neonates that tends to resolve, though in a small proportion they then develop MDS and then go on to develop Down syndrome AML, and some of them actually have this resistant form of Down syndrome AML. And through work of a number of groups, we know that um, all of these patients have a pathognomonic uh, mutation in GATA1 resulting in a GATA1 short, but they may then acquire other mutations um, that push them on to more advanced disease. But it doesn't look like this is just a cell autonomous effect. Through work that Hans has done in his lab, it looks like TMD cells and Down's AML cells from the same patients behave in different ways. So here, if you look in mouse models and you inject 
TMD cells compared to Downs AML cells, you see that the Downs AML cells, they move to the bone marrow and the spleen, whereas the TMD cells stay in the uh, right foot at the site of injection. And by contrast, if you take those Down syndrome cells, uh, the TMD cells, they tend to grow better on, um, on, uh, on fetal liver than um, AML cells. So this suggests that the tumor microenvironment and the site of hematopoiesis may make a difference. And as I've just shown you, we have a fish model that really may help us answer this. Because it may be the case that in Down syndrome uh, AML that um, really TMD may um, exist because of factors secreted in the fetal liver, such as GMCSF, uh, SCF, um, and another factor, uh, insulin growth factor 2. And then other factors such as SDF1 may be important for homing to the bone marrow to develop the um, full-blown um, AML a bit later in life. And so we are going to make use of the fish that we have that express these factors to answer these questions. And I'm proud to say that this um, is a grant that was just funded um, last week by the Canadian Cancer Society. So for the last uh, couple of minutes, I wanted to touch on um, another application of the zebrafish model. And this is while we are looking at drug responses, can we also look at safer therapies? And some of this work really sort of originated out of conversations that I'd had or questions that have been asked when I was talking about the Xenocraft model where audience, members of the audience would sometimes ask me, you know, can you look at side effects and can you look at toxicity? And I generally said, no, well, that, that one would do in mouse. Here we're just looking at, at responses. But then I got to thinking, you know, could we actually use the fish in this way? And then I was at, a, uh, at the international... Um, uh, zebrafish conference, which is also in Madison, Wisconsin, a number of, uh, a number of years ago, and my colleague uh, Randy Peterson was presenting some preliminary results about a screen that he did in fish for cardioprotectant drugs. So just to remind people, um, you know, all chemotherapy that we use has off-target effects, um, particularly conventional cytotoxic chemotherapy, it's very nonspecific. Um, and in particularly, you know, we think of short-term side effects, but there's also long-term side effects. And one of the most um, well-known is the cardiotoxicity that you get from anthracycline drugs, uh, such as doxorubicin, um, excuse me, which are used in really a, a large number of malignancies in pediatrics. We use them in both AML and ALL, uh, as well as in uh, sarcomas, but they're used in breast cancer and, and, and lots of other uh, uh, tumors. The problem is that um, uh, doxorubicin uh, can accumulate in uh, the cardiac myocytes and cause cardiac damage. And even though there's sort of a maximum lifetime dose, and we never tend to give that lifetime dose, um, we know that uh, due to work done out of Vancouver and a number of other places, that patients may have a particular pharmacogenotype, so they're sensitive at much lower doses that we give. Um, and so these patients may be cured of the leukemia, but then may have early onset heart disease, um, cardiomyopathy, heart failure. There's currently one cardioprotective drug on the market called desrazoxane. That's FDA approved. But there's been a couple of reports, including in children with leukemia, that causes secondary malignancies, such that it's been removed uh, by, um, uh, in Europe. It's not uh, licensed at all in Europe, and really is used quite cautiously in North America. And part of the problem is we don't actually know how doxorubicin causes cardiac damage. Um, we know how it functions in cancer cells. We think it may be through um, a reactive oxygen species and iron, but people have used other chelators um, and antioxidants, and it actually hasn't prevented cardiac damage. Uh, damage. So we want to know if we could use the fish to look at this. Um, the fish, again, um, not only can we look at blood cells, but it's great to look at organs. Um, so here we have the uh, mile um, 7 transgenic line where you can see a green um, fluorescent uh, heart in these fish. Um, uh, and you can see the heart beating. The fish has two chambers, the atrium and the ventricle, so you can see the heart beating. And here a more recent picture, this is again taken in um, those flasper fish, but here we've labeled um, the uh, cardiac myocytes in um, uh, RFP, so you have um, a green fish with these, uh, with these red hearts that we can see in uh, three dimensions. So as you can imagine, we can study effects on the heart uh, very easily uh, using these models. And so uh, what Randy's lab did was they showed that if they treated fish with doxorubicin, they got this um, abnormal heart phenotype where you got pericardial edema 
and an elongated atrium, and actually the heart functionally didn't look, um, didn't work as well. And so this really um, resembled um, anthracycline-induced cardiotoxicity. And then Randy performed a screen. Again, you can do this in large numbers uh, with these embryos, 3,000 compound screen, and identified visnagin and diphenylurea as two drugs that when you treated together with doxorubicin actually restored a normal uh, cardiac structure and showed, uh, also rescued um, contractility and blood flow in these embryos. And this was in a dose-dependent manner. So suggesting that these were really important, that these were potential new cardioprotectant drugs. And when Randy presented this work, I said to him, well, what's the effect that these have on, uh, on the cancer cells? And he says, well, well, we don't really know how to do that. And I said, well, why don't we use our xenograft model to try to answer that? Because if you're protecting the cancer cells at the same time that you're protecting the heart cells, this is, this is going to be a bit of a hard sell. And so what we were able to show is that um, uh, when we uh, put in, so again, here we inject um, uh, our cells into the fish, uh, treat at baseline. Here we're injecting at 24 hours, and we look at what happens to those cells. You can see that um, the cells, these are, again, we use Jercat cells, TLL cells, which are, uh, we use doxorubicin to treat TLL. You can see from baseline, treated with vehicle, visnagin, diphenylurea, or desrazoxane, you still see proliferation um, of those cells. And then importantly, when you treat with doxorubicin, um, you can inhibit proliferation of those cells, and that um, inhibition of proliferation isn't affected, isn't abrogated when you treat with, um, together with bisnagin diphenylurea. So we can rescue or prevent the heart phenotype. We still get killing of the um, leukemia cells, and this sort of suggests that we can really use the fish to look at uh, protective drugs while we're developing new therapies. Can we give other therapies uh, more safely? And my last data slide, I'll just mention that we're using this for other side effects now. This is the ototoxicity the, that's caused by cisplatin, which is used to treat a number of, uh, of cancers. Uh, it causes deafness because it affects the hair cells. How can we study deafness in the fish? Well, fish don't have ears, but they do have these neural masks, which are shown here as these green fluorescent dots along the lateral line that help the fish with uh, with balance as they're swimming, so sort of analogous to what the hair cells do in our vestibular system. When we treat with cisplatin, you see we can eliminate um, those hair cells. And what uh, Jamie and Babak uh, in the lab have been able to show is that um, uh, we know that cisplatin can re um, produces reactive oxygen species. The question is if we inhibit those reactive oxygen species, and the reactive oxygen species may be important for um, effect of the drug on um, tumor cells, but may also be causing some of the ototoxicity. We wanted to look at this, and what we found is when we treated these fish injected with neuroblastoma cells um, as well, uh, and then treated them with both cisplatin and antioxidants, uh, an antioxidant called apocyanin, we were able to rescue the, the neural mass phenotype so we didn't damage the hair cells, but we still killed the um, neuroblastoma cells, suggesting that really ROS levels may be contributing to the damage uh, in, the, uh, in the inner ear, but are not, is not essential for, um, for the uh, cytotoxic effect. And this is really important. Antioxidants are on the market. People don't know if they should take them. Are they going to be helpful or harmful? Again, maybe the fish can help sort that out. So hopefully I've been able to show you today that there's a lot of advantages to using the FISH model. This is taken from a, uh, a chapter in a textbook um, that Graham Dallaire and I um, edited with the late Bob Arsisi, um, uh, where we try to juxtapose the zebrafish compared to uh, other uh, animal models. Um, I haven't shown you all of these examples today, but we talked about conservation, uh, screening, xenografts. Um, all of those things are feasible in the FISH and at less cost. And what I could probably add to this table now, because now this is a, a couple years old, is the advantages to studying the microenvironment and, uh, and drug toxicities. So I want to thank all the folks uh, uh, in my lab. Uh, this is in the, uh, the new uh, Life Sciences Research Institute, where my lab relocated a, uh, um, a couple of years ago. And this was at our official um, uh, lab opening. People don't dress this nicely all the time. So the lab is just through the glass uh, here. Um, uh, a lot of the work I showed you today was done by a couple of past lab members, uh, Mike Forrester, who's now a pediatric resident in uh, Newfoundland, and uh, Andrew Coombs, uh, current lab members. We've had uh, great collaborators who I've mentioned uh, throughout the talk, and I'm thankful for our funding. And I'll be happy to take any questions.
Great. So that's a great question. So zebrafish will live three, even to five years. In most research labs, people won't keep fish beyond a couple of years because they start developing spontaneous infections. And most of us have these uh, recirculating water systems where all the tanks are connected. So all you need is an infection in one fish, and you can wipe out your entire colony fairly, uh, fairly quickly. I mean, we do surveillance every day, and sick fish are removed. But, but that's a concern. Um, I, I think your question is also getting to natural tumors that the fish develop with age. Um, it's very rare for them to develop a, um, a leukemia or a mild proliferative disease with age. They do spontaneously develop um, some germ cell tumors and some peripheral nerve sheet tumors, uh, but uh, it would be rare for them to develop a, a, a leukemia with age. So you're right, those fish that I showed, they develop um, a, the smile of um, neoplasm relatively later in life, though at a fairly high percentage, but we would never see that in, in wild type. Model. Okay. So, I mean, presumably, bone marrow samples, unless you, unless you sort them before you inject them, are pretty heterogeneous population of cells. If you looked at kind of pre and post growing them from the zebrafish, how the you know, phenotype of the population changes? So that's a great question. I mean, as you well know, you know, in um, you know, in a, in a kid with ALL a diagnosis, often the marrow is pretty full. You know, predominantly going to be filled with lymphoblasts. So you're right, there are going to be some stroma and other elements, and we haven't subdivided uh, those uh, yet. Um, interestingly, one of the things that we're proposing to do for some of our neuroblastoma work is to look at primary patient um, neuroblastoma metastasis and try to pull those out from the bone marrow. And those we propose doing with, with sorting to make sure we're just pulling out those cells and not other hematopoietic cells. So I think that will get to sort of what you're asking in terms of different cell uh, populations. One of the other things we want to try is can we pull out stem cell, leukemic stem cell populations uh, compared to um, the, the bulk leukemia. Terrific talk. Thank you. Possibly unknown to you within many yards of this room was the term of the late Robert A. Good, world-class immunologist. He and his team, including Ben Polaris, studied the ontogeny of the immune response in zebrafish. So I was very pleased when Troy took on the zebrafish model. I think it's a very exciting model and to be applauded for all this work. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, Troy's been a great, uh, a, a great colleague. Um, he, um, you know, again, he's developed and very generously shared a lot of these tools that I think are going to be very, uh, very helpful. And of course, he's interested in, in transplant immunology uh, given his clinical, uh, clinical interests. In your in your xenograph model, you probably said, but I missed it, how do you label the tumor cells? So that's a great question. Um, I didn't get into that in detail. It's a couple of different ways. We can either label them with a transmembrane dye, which is what we have to use for primary samples and for some of the cell lines. So we've used a number of different things, um, something called cell tracker, something called CMDII, something called CMDIO. Uh, but we can also use cell lines can be permanently labeled, like with GFP or M-cherry or tomato. And, and those can be uh, injected as well. One of the things that you may be getting at, um, which the reviewers frequently like to ask us, is you know, what happens as those cells divide? If you have a membrane dye, does your signal uh, decrease? And we were able to show in uh, the paper in Hematologica that whether we had them labeled with GFP or a membrane dye, given the window we were looking at, we didn't see a difference in terms What's of the uh, proliferation. Was it the window? The window's pretty short. So, Different studies are slightly different. So for example, the ones that we did with Dr. Peterson were earlier, because that's when he looked at his phenotype. But we're looking usually somewhere between um, 72 hours and, and, and five days. A historical note on Pat's the, I believe the first report of an association of Down syndrome that's and leukemia was uh, also from here, Bill Privet, I think, Bob Good. Right. So that's like 50 feet from here to that. So that's great. Really fun. Um, it's hollow ground. It, as my boy from Toronto says, this is the land of giants uh, in many ways. A uh, question on the, um, you mentioned L LNCAP cells and putting those. Uh, have you used any uh, human solid tumor cells associated with putting them in? That's a cell line. What about any primary yes. human Yes. So that's a great question. So we have not done primary solid tumors yet. Those sort of uh, get to sort of Mike's point about heterogeneity. So I have a colleague of mine in the Netherlands who's done this with some breast tumors. And as you can imagine, you get a whole gamish of things 
that you put in there, and that may be very tricky, but people have done it. There are reports of people doing it with some primary pancreatic tumors. The f using our approach, we wanted the first ones we're going to try to do are these neuroblastoma cells sure. because we think that you know they're in the bone marrow, they're right. on the same size as the AML yeah, cells, so, so we, could, we have the technical sort of experience uh, to try that. But you know, it's obviously something we'd like to do. When I presented this work at SAR, I didn't get to present our sarcoma work. We've adapted this assay to look at migration uh, in sarcomas, and together with Paul Sorensen at UBC, have identified factors that are associated with sarcoma migration. And when I presented that at sarcoma meetings, you know, the sarcoma folks would like us to try primary sarcoma. Sure. So hopefully, we'll be able to uh, to do that at some point. Thank you. So I just want to thank uh, Jason for coming and uh, sharing with us your expertise. Um, as a colleague, he has really put collegial into the term colleague, oh, and um, I'm sure he's very welcome of people who might email you or other of course. Um, with respect to questions or potentially ideas that you have. So again, thank you very much for coming. And <laughs>